Well, hey, Nick, thanks for joining me today. I'm looking forward to our conversation here quite a bit. Uh, man, I, I am humbled, Warren. I really am. Anytime I get asked to speak anything, whether it's preach or at a conference or anything, man, I just, I truly feel honored and humbled that you would even care to have me on here. So <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> well, brother. well, this is something that I know you've preached on. I know you're, yeah. you're uh, passionate on this topic and this topic yeah, yeah. is judgment and Christian judgment. And mm -hmm. there's a, you know, there's a million things about this that we could be talking about. So we'll start at a pretty high level of yeah. when 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 even people first start thinking of this, they think of Christian judgment. What are some of the things that that come to mind for you? And we'll dig into the details a little bit later. But what is even Christian judgment? What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it, it kind of depends on the perspective of the person. So is this a. Uh, well, I, I guess it's not only non-believers kind of looking at the church saying, quoting Matthew 7, 1, although they may not even know they're quoting Matthew 7, 1, where it yeah. says, Jesus out of Jesus' mouth, do not judge. And that's usually coming from a defensive posture. Um, however, Christians within the church often will use that in a defensive posture if they feel being judged. Um, and then you have the other end of the spectrum where you've got hardcore truth people that um, have bought into the idea that it's my job, it's their responsibility. Somehow it's our Christian responsibility to speak truth. Now, let's say it that way, but essentially that's mass yeah. judgment in a lot of cases. Right, uh, right. And, and I would agree with, with the crazy thing. I would agree with both sides. The middle ground there, too, that I that I firmly believe that we need to be walking in as um, as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, so let, let's dig more into, you know, you mentioned Matthew 7. Um, that's what everybody yes. knows. I I would guess that outside of the church, that has, like, everybody used to know John 3.16 because, you know, you'd see the yes. signs and football stadiums and stuff. And and now it's sort of everybody outside the church, well, they know Jesus said, don't judge. And so <laughs> it's sort of that's the limit of knowledge about the topic yes. is they think that all that is written there. But um, a few verses later in that, just a few verses later is when we're told, okay, after we take the plank out of our own eye, yes. then we can see clearly to remove the speck from a brother's eye. So yeah. what's, um, you know, and I suppose we could do the whole hour just on this, but in that yeah. part of Matthew seven, what are, what are some of your thoughts on, on that? Let's, let's just unpack that beginning part of Matthew seven a little bit more. Yeah. So I, uh, first off, I think we need to understand that we are actually called in certain circumstances to judge. Uh, we have to, right? But there's also a difference between uh, being judgmental and making correct judgments, right? So what I, what I see Jesus say, do not judge. And then he goes into all of that. And we'll go into that in a second. To me, he said, um, and even later on in, in um, John 7, 24, he says, right. stop judging by mere appearance, but instead judge correctly. Right. So, yes, he says here, do not judge, but there's a whole lot of other uh, parts to that. Um, it's more about how do we judge and how do we judge correctly? So this verse kind of gives us an indication of one of the ways that we can judge cor correctly. And I would say uh, he's teaching us how to judge carefully, right? Not hypocritically, right? To judge uh, correctly is to not judge hypocritically, meaning I know my tendency as a human being, I've been a believer for 19 years and a man, I've, I've had a lot of sins that I've struggled with over the years. Some that are still haunt me today, some that uh, Christ has given me victory over. And for me, what's odd is I tend to see the sin in other people that I struggle with myself. Mm -hmm. And if I've yeah. seen victory over that, I, I somehow want to puff up as if I did something to earn that victory. When really it was the power of the Holy Spirit just maturing and working through my life. Right. And if I don't remember that, uh, I look at that person very hypocritically and in the wrong type of judgment, which is what Jesus is essentially alluding to in Matthew 7. It's, hey, judge carefully here. Like, like first off, make sure you're not struggling with that same sin. And it may not be due to the capacity of that person is, but there's still a sin there, which brings in empathy. And if you are... Before you ever waltz into any kind of judgment, whether it's mentally or especially face to face, you better make sure that you're you're clean in that area as well. Yeah, yeah, and and you you mentioned in there a couple times the the issue of hypocrisy, and that is a charge that as as Christians we get regularly. 
and it it's a uh, I have I have plenty of thoughts on on that as well. But what are what are some of your thoughts about um, what what is Christian hypocrisy? If we're going to talk about you know what is Christian judgment, yeah. I guess a parallel conversation there is is the hypocrisies that that's part of it. So what is Christian hypocrisy from from your vo- viewpoint? How do you how do you view uh, that? Yeah, great question. First off, I, I think we've earned it as a church, unfortunately, in many ways. Um, and I think part of it comes down to, and we didn't start here, is Paul even says, um, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 12, where he says at the back end of that verse, after he's talking about uh, judging a particular guy in the congregation, uh, if you don't know this, he's actually sleeping with his stepmom, <laughs> and they are called to go to him to exercise church discipline, right? And even that we're to do in a particular manner with with grace and humility um, and the right type of judgment. But on the back end of that entire passage, he says, hey, don't judge people outside the church. Like that's not for us to do. You said John 3, 16 right up front and people forget about John 17, 3, mm-hmm. 17, which says right. that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to... Uh, uh, to save them. And I thought that was interesting. And I, I'm getting somewhere with the hypocrisy, yeah. but I want to read this. Um, Toby Mack just yesterday, uh, I believe on one of his social media chains, quoted, if God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, I doubt God sent you. He mm-hmm, sent yeah. us to do that. So yeah. I, I do want to clarify, right? Our judgment mostly that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7, Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 12 and some other passages is really to be placed to brothers and sisters within the church that have the same spirit, the same eyes, the same heart to feel with and eyes to see with. So I think where we often get labeled hypocritical, it can come from people that are in a defensive position. And sometimes it's earned, but a lot of times it's people outside the church when they're looking on and and we're judging them, which we're called not really to do. Now we are to make certain judgments, but judgment in the sense of, um, maybe their salvation or their eternal destination. Uh, we got to be very careful how we speak to the un, un, uh, the outside world. Um, and again, we can do all of that, right, Warren, and still get labeled as judgmental and hypocritical. That's yeah. the hard part of all yeah. of this. But man, I want to sleep at the end of the night knowing, man, I think I really did that in the most God-honoring way. And if I'm still labeled that way, I really think that's on them and for God to deal with, not on me. But yeah. I think we've done that in many many ways that have come across very arrogantly um, as if somehow we've earned our own salvation, we've earned our own spiritual maturity. And when we come across that way, it really does look extremely hypocritical to the world. Yeah. Did, did that answer your, mm-hmm. your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it did. And and so one of the, one of the things as we, as we keep digging into this and, and you mentioned the, the passage from, uh, from John seven, and yeah. and that that one isn't as well known, right? We all know yeah. in Matthew seven, don't judge, yeah. do not judge, yes. judge not. How, you know, we we know that one. Then we get to John seven, and we were specifically told to judge, but judge correctly. Yeah. Yes. And so that that part there is is where I think the the discernment, which is a word I'm yes. sure we'll get into here as well, is where that discernment yeah. comes into play. When we're told to to look, well, this is good fruit versus bad fruit. Well, how do I how do I make that determination? How mm. do I decide what's good fruit, what's bad fruit? How do I discern? How do yeah. I how do I do this? You know, if, if yeah, Jesus is great. telling stop judging by appearance, but judge correctly, okay, how? Like how how do I make the <laughs> how do I make that determination? Yeah. yeah. I like that you brought up uh, discernment. Actually, the definition of discernment is the ability to judge well, right? And we are called over and over again in scripture to be discerning through the power of the Holy Spirit, but right alongside the Word of God, right? The Word of God has to be our authoritative figure in all that we do and we say, and even when we judge, right? And and really, we can't draw lines where the Bible doesn't draw lines. And I think as Christians, we so often, almost in a pharisaical way, start to judge based on lines that are not scriptural, right? Paul, in Romans 14, gives this um, entire... Um, it kind of lesson, it kind of bleeds into 15 where he starts off and he says, accept one another. Now, remember, this is all in-house stuff here. So we're talking about as brothers and sisters, which sometimes that looks the worst to the outside world. 
yeah. when we're putting up this person and this person. And and again, I understand some of those people may be, well, I'm trying to protect the church from false theology and those things. And again, we have to make judgments on those things for our own good as a pastor for the congregation that God has appointed me to oversee for my family. Um, but even in that, we just have to be very careful on discerning what is right and what is wrong or what is biblical and what is preference. There's a huge difference there of black and white. And then these areas are gray that God has given us personal conviction over for me and maybe not for you. Right. And that's what John our Romans 14 is about. It's he's speaking to the Jews. And matter of fact, he's calling the Jews weaker Christians there, not the Gentiles. A lot of times people think that. And he's saying, hey, Jews that are trying to lord over the Old Testament laws, what they can eat and not eat, all the ceremonies. He's like, hey, if you want to continue to do those things and you're convicted by doing those or not doing those, great. But you do not need to lord those over the Gentiles anymore or judge them because they do or don't partake in certain things that you feel convicted by. So I think we need to get very, very clear, be very careful before we judge to say, okay, is this even scriptural or is it yeah. traditional? Tradition can line up with scripture, but oftentimes our tradition, I'm getting ready to speak, actually preach on alcohol this weekend. <laughs> and part of it is, hey, you may have come to a belief in alcohol, what the Bible says that may not be biblical because yeah. of how you were brought yeah. up, because of uh, maybe the way that your church beat it over your head at one side or the other. And really what we need to do today, I'm going to say to the congregation, is let's look at really what the Bible says on there. And what it boils down to is there's some preferences there and some liberties that we can walk in and don't have to be judgmental in the middle of those. Now, we need to be wise, discerning about all of those, which is the direction I'm going. Yeah. Um, but I think that that I, I think to answer your question is, man, we've really got a good handle on what does the Bible say about this subject? And then if it is black and white, how do we go into whatever we're going into? Is it a discussion with an individual that we know is sinning? How do we do that well, graciously, humbly, um, and not hypocritically? So, so, so what's a, what's an example uh, of that, of, of doing that well, of doing that graciously, uh, maybe something you've even dealt with in the church, obviously no names yeah. or anything like that, but what, what, what would be an example? So guys who are listening, they can kind of put themselves in that scenario and say, okay, that's, that's how I could do that. That's a way that I could yeah. do that. What's an example of that? Yeah, that's great. So one example, um, I think this could be a good example. So, so I often get, as people feel safe to maybe have conversations around me, I've got to discern as people are telling me something, let's say it's a man about his wife. Or maybe vice versa, right? And I'm very careful on having conversations with women and how far that goes. But let's say she's telling me a certain thing about her husband and it's not good, right? My tendency, our tendency is to automatically believe the person, right? Because people are very good at selling their side of the story or telling their narrative. Um, and one of the best pieces of advice, is, advice that was ever given to me is they're all liars until you get them in the same room. Um, and I've seen that played out. And another way to look at that is, you observe something about an individual and you don't know the backstory. You don't know the context for why, why they said or did something. And again, it could be sinful. Like you don't have to know the context to know, okay, what they did was not right. But I also don't know how they got to that conclusion. So I want to know more about that person before I ever make a full judgment or even judge what they did, not to justify it away, but they just learn a little bit more about that person. So for instance, I had a good friend um, who was really, really uh, uh, hard on their father and said that, man, they, they are, um, they don't have a great relationship. He didn't love me in the way that, that I felt that he, he needed to love me. And it really had hurt their relationship for a while and it never approached it. And I just asked one simple question uh, and it wasn't to, to steal from the feelings that they felt, right? It was just to help them maybe see another layer there that they had yet to see or ever get to know. And I just said, hey, look, tell me a little bit more about how your father grew up. Like, how did his father treat him? And she's like, oh, it was actually way worse than the way he treated me. Like, yeah. he never showed it, uh, uh, never, his father never um, told him he loved him, never expressed it. And I said, so do you possibly think that your dad's love towards you, he thinks he's doing a great job 
because he's doing way better than his father did to him. So again, it wasn't justifying maybe the lack of love or some of the things that he did that were really just wrong, but just helping to see a layer of the heart that maybe they hadn't seen before. So I think sometimes we come to these presuppositions and these quick judgments without fully knowing the whole story. And, And the Bible's all over not doing that as well. So not only do we need to judge carefully, we need to judge objectively, not subjectively. And with all the crud that's out there, even about pastors and churches and theology and all of that, we can see people can take one line of a sermon and they can blast that out on social media. And all of a sudden we can make a quick judgment about that pastor in that church. And that's just not fair. And it's so easy to do because that's what social media and that's what the world has come to. Um, And as a person that's a pastor, I don't necessarily fear that, but I could easily see how somebody could take one thing out of my sermons and turn it into whatever they want. And as believers who care about the church, we care about unbelievers knowing Jesus Christ. Man, we've got to be careful of blazing judgments first on, on our brothers and sisters, on pastors and on churches before we ever know the full story behind it. And we better be careful about blasting that out on social media under the guise of, I'm just trying to protect the church. Okay, but really, are you doing that or are you just trying to make yourself feel better about the sins in your life because of this, someone else's sin? So I don't know if that answered your question. I think it did just a couple examples of just, man, we just got to be careful. And again, scripture, scripture warns. I just give you a few verses and then let you say Proverbs 18, 13, spout off before listening to the facts is both shameful And it's foolish. Proverbs 18, 17, in a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone comes forward and cross-examines that person. All of that is saying, judge objectively, get all of the facts. And then you may find out, first off, I don't even need to judge. This isn't my place. Or, man, I do need to approach this situation, but now I have more of the facts and hopefully I can go in there with a little bit more of an open mind, or I need to go in there to find the facts out to help discern through this situation. And it- and I like um, several things in there. One of the things talking about how in, in our social media world, just pulling a single line or a single clip or not even a sentence, right? Just a sentence yeah. fragment, you know, that that's enough. Um, and, and also that ties to something that, that I talk about a lot. I'm sure you bring this up regularly as well. And that's kind of the danger of a single Bible verse, the danger of cherry picking out a single Bible verse. And, you know, I I lead men's events and we we use Bible verses, but I talk ahead of time. Guys, Mm. we're using Bible verses, but single Bible verses are dangerous. You need the full context. You need to know in what context is this said? And and sometimes you need to know the whole the whole chapter. Sometimes you need to know the whole book. Sometimes you need to know the entire Bible to really get that context. And how how does knowing the Bible um, and and I, I don't expect the guys who are listening, I don't expect really very many people at all. Nobody has the I shouldn't say nobody. Somebody does. Nobody has the Bible <laughs> memorized from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. But no. knowing the Bible, actually knowing what these what these books are about, knowing knowing that, how does that help judgment? How does that help me to discern? How does that help me as a Christian and dealing with this issue of judgment? Because a lot of people, they, you know, the Bible, well, you know, it's, it's just this nice book and I can read it sometimes, but I go to church. I don't really do Bible studies. I don't really read it. So how does the Bible help me in this context? Well, first off, it judges our own hearts and our motives, right? Um, Was that Hebrews? Help me out here. Is it Hebrews 4 that says the Bible is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword? Mm -hmm. It penetrates the heart and soul, bone and marrow, and it judges the motives of the heart. So first and foremost, I'm not reading the Bible so I can go out and judge other people. I'm reading the Bible so to let the Bible judge my own actions, my own heart, my own motive. Now, I'm not always willing to accept a lot of that. I mean, I have pride at the core of everything I do as well, at the core of every one of my sins and struggles. Um, But man, I've learned to, man, I've got to go before this to check my own mark, my own motives first. And then secondly, um, the Bible, I mean, ultimately, I I guess I'll look at it this way, Warren. I've been a a believer now for almost 19 years. I've been a pastor for right around 10 years. And if there's one thing that I can put close to the top of the list that I'm learning, uh, not only as a pastor, but as a believer, 
is I, I don't know as much as I think I know. And um, that's humbling. And I, I don't want to be the person that is arrogant and prideful in my beliefs. I want to be the person that, yes, I want to stand firm on the close handed issues, who Jesus is, the fact that he came to this life to do what I could not do, that I am I'm wicked and depraved that I can't even see all of my sin because of how sinful I am. And that I, there's nothing I could do to earn God's righteousness, which is the very reason that Jesus Christ came. God in human form lived the perfect life, died on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins, for whoever cries out to him, makes him Lord and Savior. Um, and then rose and was buried, rose on the third day for the, uh, for the hope of all those that are in him and die one day as well. So all of that, right, born of a virgin, close-handed stuff, I'm not wavering on that. Now, I can have a civil discussion. Somebody can disagree with me, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not going to condemn that person. I'm in the long game, hopefully, with that person. Yeah. And yeah. I don't want to ruin these relationships to where, man, when they finally start to come around um, to maybe wanting to ask and God's working on their hearts, I want to be one of those people that they come to and say, man, you've never treated me but with anything with respect and grace. So I've got some questions for you. That's the way we have to see the lens from the outside world. But if I'm constantly posting in judgmental ways without context where they can't hear my voice, they can't hear my heart. Like I just got off of that social media ban a long time ago. And if I'm going to say something about scripture, I'm usually going to start with brothers and sisters. This is directed towards you, right? And then I'm going to give some vulnerability and transparency about my own life. Um, so again, if the unbelieving friends that are looking at my messages, God can use that, but hopefully they're not looking at it as condemning towards them because it's not my place to condemn them. They're already condemned in the eyes of God. That's God's judgment on them. So um, is this all about the Bible? I completely lost where we were going. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, that, my, how, does, how does the Bible help us You know, with, with this idea of judgment? Yeah. So it, it, if anything, if we're reading it with, the correct motive, the motive first of God, change me, humble me. Mo I mean, I always tell our congregation, preach the gospel to yourself every day. And if you do that, you remember you were lost and undone. I am lost and undone. I was a 20 year old punk kid who wanted nothing to do with God that one day walked into a Baptist church, mainly to appease my future mother-in-law and didn't want to, didn't even want to be there. And an hour later, wanted to know everything. That's not Nick Tallow. That is the power of God working on my heart. I can't take credit for that. When I preach that to myself and knowing that, hey, I could have passed away before then and spent all of eternity in a real place called hell, but yet God, for some reason, reached into this 20-year-old punk's life, that drops me to my knees and oftentimes brings tears to my eyes. That is the motivating factor. By the way, that's scripture. That's Bible. That's the word of God. That then when I get into that, it's not about, hey, can I know more than the next person so I can slam them biblically? No, right. that's not the right. motive in getting into the word of God. It's so that when we get faced with a situation where we do have to discern, Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The best way to renew is the alive act of word of God. But what about verse 3? So that we will know the perfect, pleasing will of God. Meaning we get faced with a situation where we have to judge, we have to discern. It's the word of God that's planted in our hearts so deep that the spirit of God then can bring that out. If we're not doing that, we're working off of human intellect alone, not off of, I just did a sermon on heavenly wisdom versus godly wisdom. Where do we gain godly wisdom from? The word of God. That's the number right. one way we can walk wisely, as Proverbs says over and over and over again, not arrogantly, but wisely is to be filled up with the word of God. If we're not filled up with the word of God and we're just filled up with an hour of church every Sunday, we're making decisions based on our past upbringings, emotions, experiences. All of those can play a factor. But if that's the only thing we're basing them off of, we're being led incorrectly. And that's where arrogance, that's where pride, that's where hypocrisy, all the things of the flesh come out versus the things of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness and self-control yeah which lead yeah, and, beautifully into making correct judgments right right so and and that you mentioned in there you know go go into church for an hour it's how do i put this nicely i struggle with that because um 
if I'm working with a guy and he tells me, you know, yeah, well, I go, I go to church every, every week and that's about it. Yeah. We live in a culture in a society where for the most part, it's against that one hour to put it mm. mildly, I guess. And that one hour isn't enough to, mm. to defend against every other hour of every other day. That's really good. Uh, sort of attacking that one hour. Yeah. If if I um if I decided tomorrow, you know what's really important to me is I don't know. I want to be uh I want to be a world class uh bicyclist. I yeah. want to do that. And then somebody says, "Cool. How much time are you going to spend training and practicing on that?" I'm like, "Yeah. I don't know. Maybe an hour, but of that hour, really only about 25 or 30 minutes in there is going to be really focused. That yeah. should do it. Yeah. Somebody would look at me and say, well, you're, you clearly, you know, like you're, you're not going to get there. So, yeah. That's a great analogy. Anyway, Mark, I just great. got on a rant, not related to our topic, but that kind of, that no, kind of I mean, I, here's there. the deal. Here's the deal. Church, church yeah. is not, it's not for us that can feed ourselves, right? It's, it's not for us. Church, church has become this consumerism type of thing. Um, and church is commanded of us in scriptures, Hebrews four, let's not stop meeting with each other, but church yeah. for us is to come and to be and to worship with God in unity with our brothers and sisters. There is something powerful that happens when I worship with my brothers and sisters, musical worship versus just in my house, not saying God can't do something beautiful in my house, right. but there's something different when we're collectively coming and hearing the word of God together. There is something that's powerful that can happen. Don't get me wrong. But church ultimately is not necessarily about us. It's about God. It's the worship of God and the congregation coming together locally to serve together in a lot of cases. So um, I, lo I love that example. But that's not it. That can't just be the end game right. for right. us. If we're going to live out um, and become more like Jesus, which is our ultimate goal, is to glorify God and magnify Jesus Christ in our lives my life has to look more like Jesus next year. I shouldn't say has to. I want it to look like Jesus right. the next day versus the, that's not going to come from an hour on Sunday. Just like you said, it's not going to come from anything else we want to master in life or we want to become better at. We wouldn't treat anything else in that way, but yet so many treat Christianity in that way. It's a great, yeah. great example. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that ties into judgment, right? So again, if we're not filling ourselves with the word of God, but yet in hour and again you said it best it's not even really an hour although musical worship when focused on the truth of true, god's word can true. fill yeah. us up so but yeah. i understand the teachings of god's words maybe 30 maybe 40 depending upon the church you go into and that's it again we're going to come up with a situation and we're going to either operate off of our default which could be biblical if it's not going into our heads on a regular basis right we can get into neuroscience we're going to operate subconsciously off of the past 80% of the time of the wiring we put into our brain. And the wiring, the strongest ones, are based on what's the loudest voice that's constantly going into your ear. Yeah. So the, the other side of that, though, is, and, and again, just talked about this when it came to wisdom and earning wisdom, is we can go to the other end of the spectrum, though, and we can go to church. We can listen to podcasts. We can fill our mind constantly with sermons and all of these things, almost as a substitute for the word of God. And, mm -hmm. and ultimately what that can end up doing is just puffing us up with knowledge and information. And we can kind of kind of um, we can get deceived into thinking that that somehow we're growing spiritually, being matured because we're gaining just a bunch of information. That's not really the objective as all as well at all. When, when, when um, King Solomon talks about wisdom, that word literally is to know right from wrong and then to apply it correctly in our lives. So the first thing is, yes, judging. You have to know what is right and wrong. Are we judging correctly here? That's known as the word of God. But then it's the power of the Holy Spirit to then work that out in our lives. Otherwise, we just become puffed up, arrogant people who have a bunch of Bible knowledge more than the next person. Right. So there's kind of a tension there. And, and I like that you mentioned earlier Romans 12, too. Uh, I've gone back to that verse a lot over the last couple of years. Um, yeah. I generally don't have a single life verse, but I have been going back to Romans 12, too, quite a lot. 
because that favorites. point of changing changing the way we think changing that part of our mind yeah because as you said otherwise i could just be filled with a bunch of knowledge I could yeah. tell you, you know, this is this is this is the third verse in Isaiah, in Isaiah. Here's the, you know, I could tell you all that stuff. Yeah. I could be, hey, I'm the one guy that knows what all the minor prophets are talking about. Like, cool, but does it change the way you think? Does it mm-hmm. change actually who you are and how you're interacting with everybody else in in your life? Uh, I want to come back to a uh, cultural thing. Um, we were talking a little bit about you know kind of culture and that that part of our society. One of the phrases that that is pretty common in, in our culture when it comes to this idea of judgment is the simple phrase, well, who are you to judge? Mm. And um, how, how would you answer that? If, if you were talking with somebody, we'll, we'll keep it even within the church, right? We'll talk yeah. about somebody in the church who is a fellow believer, who is on yeah. this walk with you, and you're, you're doing your part to, to follow as best as you can the, the proper mm. way of, of, of dealing with a, a challenge with somebody and their response back is, well, only God can judge me. Who are you to judge? How do you answer yeah. that? Well, I, I made a mistake earlier. I said 1 Corinthians 12, when Paul was talking to the church in Corinth about that man. But 1 Corinthians 5 is actually the, the passage. I apologize. And I want to go to that because, um, again, judging correctly, when I preached this before, I've said there's three things. We need to judge carefully, Matthew 7. We need to judge objectively. Um, and then we need to judge lovingly. I think it boils down to what is the motives of our heart. If I'm going to approach a brother or sister of mine and make a judgment, why am I doing it? Right? I also talk about that in the context of gossip. Gossip to me is all about the motives of the heart. Why are you telling me this about this person? Is yeah. it because they're they're sinning, they're struggling, you can see that and you just you want me to feel the way you feel about them? Maybe they've hurt you or is it because you're struggling and you want to know how to deal with that person in a proper biblical manner? To me, that's not gossip. As long as I'm a trusted person that knows I'm going to steer you back to the word of God, right? I think we all need wise counsels like that, that we can bounce things off of um, that will that will tell us sometimes, hey, you're, you're making an incorrect judgment there or you're gossiping in the wrong way. Now, you need to check your heart. So I think it comes down to the, the motives of the heart. So if you look at 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul tells the, the church, hey, you need to remove this guy from the church. He, he is, you've gone to him, he's not listening, he's starting to create havoc within the church, then we do have a right to judge you in that case, right? And, and if I was doing anything, even as a pastor, I hope the elders of the church who have full responsibility um, would come and judge me correctly. But the heart there, if you go to then 2 Corinthians 2, when he brings back up this guy, he says the heart here is to remove this guy so we can hopefully reckon to be reconciled so he can see his sin for what it is and be restored and bring him back into the congregation. Or what is that? Galatians 6 that says, um, restore your, what is it here? Restore your brother gently. Um, here it is. This is a good one. Sorry. Let me pull it out real quick. That's all right. Yeah, you can uh, pull it up. No problem. Galatians, no problem. Um, I think it's six one. Here it is. He says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit, key passage there, meaning you are walking in step with the Spirit. That is, the, you're, being, you're being motivated by the Spirit of God, which is always going to be gracious and humble and loving, just like Jesus lived his life out, right? The hardest people he was on were the Pharisees, the supposable religious sect. When he went to the outside unbelieving world, Man, he hung out with them. He loved on them. He built relationships with them. He didn't judge them far, far. If he judged people, it was people inside the church. And it was to help them see the motives of the heart, right? So even here, when Paul says, when they're caught and saying, you who live by the spirit, I go back to the judge carefully, make sure you're going in, should restore that person gently, gently. Mm -hmm. So when somebody says, who are you to judge? I would say, well, I'm your brother. I love you. I want the best for your life. And I see something in your life that you may not be seeing in your life. And I want the best for you, right? It's not because I'm trying to make myself feel better. Although if that's a motive of mine, I got to check that because that's so easy for us to do. I want to elevate their sin to make my sin look a lot less. Yeah. That's a huge one that again, subconsciously through the flesh, the, the, uh, the power of the sinful nature in us um, just comes out if we're not careful. We got to put that in check. 
and then go to that person and to look to restore them gently. Is that, and, and is I that like, what you I like said? How you mentioned, yeah, I like how you mentioned that we're, we're, we're kicking him out of the church, so to speak. But in order to bring him back, really, is ultimately yeah, the yeah. point. It's not just go away. It, it reminds me in some instances of, of you know, leaving the 99 to go get the one. People, yeah. people talk about that, uh, about, well, here's the 99 and they're all being mean and rude and judge, judgy and, 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 and they kicked this guy out of the church because of it. And so Jesus went after him. Yes, but to bring him back, not, yes. not, to, not to just leave him and go hang I out over that. there. It was to bring yes. him back. So we're yeah. all, all together again, going in, going in the same direction. Um, I want to bring up a, uh, a scenario to you. And, and I'll need to word this kind of carefully. So uh, a friend of mine is going through a, a challenging issue within their church. Um, there's, a, there's a man that he knows, and he's known him for, I think he said, 10, 10 years, so a while. Yep. But recently found out that this man has done some pretty horrible things in his past and b- bad stuff. And yep. um, uh, from, from all information this man has changed has has repented you know is trying to do the right thing but now that now that my friend is aware of what has gone on there's there's judgment there's condemnation and he's really working through how to deal with this situation Mm -hmm. and i realize i'm being a little vague there but i didn't ask for permission for details so i have to be a little vague yeah Um, absolutely but um how does somebody deal with deal with that? And how does judgment in this, in that context connect? We talked about judgment and its relationship with discernment. How about judgment and its relationship with forgiveness? Mm. So, so here's, here's a man who has done bad things. It's open, it's admitted, it's acknowledged. It's, it's under like, there's no question. Yeah. And, and now, now there's this posture of judgment for him. And at the same time, he's struggling with how to forgive and so on. So what what sort of relationship do you see that exists in a scenario like that where, yeah, bad stuff happened. Person seems to be on the path of changing. But now I know what happened, so to speak. Where's the where's the forgiveness level and how's that relate to judgment if it does? Yeah, that's good. So is the was the bad stuff done? to the individual that is their I don't friend think so. or that I don't their think brother. so. No, I don't think yeah. so. No. So I guess I would ask unless I heard you Mitch, I don't understand I wouldn't understand why this person would need to exercise forgiveness to the individual if that those acts were not done directly to him. Is that is that correct? As far as I know, it, it's Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and I know you're trying to trying to yeah. be vague there. Yeah. Um I would look at it more of like, okay, are you struggling to to not judge this person incorrectly because now you have more information about them? And even though they've admitted it, even though they're working to get past that, they're maturing in Christ, it's like, oh, I've got some new information about this person in their past that I never knew. Um, and it sounds like it's some pretty egregious sins. Um, how do I continue to befriend this person or how do I continue to love this person? Yeah, that's a better way. Yeah, person? that's a better yeah. way of phrasing it. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I would, uh, again, I would just go through these steps. First off, judge carefully, Matthew 7. Okay, am I judging this person correctly for their past sins? Well, although I don't think we should judge people, but it does give us a little bit of a, in our humanness, warped view of that individual. I, I don't think we can ignore that. Some of that's just, it just comes over us. When we find out about something, like if I found something about you, Warren, and your past that was just egregious, I don't think I could help think, oh man, I, I didn't know that about right. that person. And right. I need to quickly, quickly, be careful and check that and say, okay, how, why is it? Why am I feeling these things around this person? And are they correct feelings? And then if I just can't get over that, I believe then you've got to go to the Galatians. Well, I guess it wouldn't be Galatians six because that would be if they're caught in sin. But to me, if I was constantly having these thoughts about an individual that just weren't right, wasn't fair to them, they were a new person in Christ, but for one reason or the other, I'm struggling with it. To me, I would have to get to a place where I could humbly go to that person and just be honest with them and say, man, I found this out. Or when you told me this, man, I, I can't help but right now just look at you a little bit differently. And I know that's not fair to you. 
right? God doesn't look at you that way. And I don't want to look at that. And those weren't done to me, right? So it's not like I need to offer you forgiveness. But to me, sometimes putting that out on the table in the most uh, kindest, gracious, loving way, and just being honest about this is not how I feel I, I should feel, but this is how I feel. And maybe just talking through that with them um, is one option. Sometimes I think when you sit by yourself before the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God, he corrects that in us and then tells us there's no reason to go to that person, right? There's no reason to. So I think we need to discern in that situation based on the situation, how we deal with that. Um, yeah. I just, again, I keep saying to my previous sermons, but you, you keep asking into those. <laughs> just a few <laughs> weeks ago, I did one on conflict resolution. And I talked about, hey, 24 to 48 hours, if you have an emotion, a feeling about a certain person, maybe it's your wife um, or your spouse. And, and I said, you know, you often get said, don't go to bed angry. And I often tell young couples, one of the best things you can do is go to bed angry and sleep on it because you may wake up the next day feeling differently than when you did when you were so tired and your emotions and the spirit was not working in the way you can. And if you wake up feeling differently, great. That's assurance to God is you don't even need to approach that situation. Um, now, if you wake up strong emotions still and it's really affecting the way that you're treating that person or viewing that person, there may come a time. I'd still take the 24 to 48 hour rule yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. to approach that person in a kind and gentle way. And just to be honest with the situation. That's a really hard one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, again, that person really hadn't done anything wrong to you. They're trying to to live a life different than what they did. Um, and, and I can think of many cases where I don't think there would be any reason to approach them unless it, it truly is affecting the way you view them. Yeah. And it's and it's just the best thing to, to bring it to light, right? From darkness yeah. to light, get it out there um, in the most humble way that you can before that person. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, I, I appreciate, you agree with that? I appreciate I mean, your thoughts on yeah. that. Yeah, I do. And it's, it's hard. It, it really is. Yeah. It really is hard when, when situations like that arise. And, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll lighten it up here a little, I, well, I don't know if it'll get too late, but um, one of the things that, that I like to say to people to, to help them think through some of these things, there will be people in heaven who vote differently than you. And, <laughs> yes. and, you know, that's kind of a yes. fun, lighthearted way of saying it, but they're also, there will be people in heaven who sin differently than you. That's good. None of us are going to make it through this life without sinning. That yeah. that we we are we already have and and we will. And some people yeah. take that as a you know as a downer. Some people take that as a however we want to take that. But that's just the truth. Yeah. And and it's very easy for me to say, well, yeah, but I didn't sin that way. Mm. You know. And and then then I've sort of elevated and and. And we need to be really careful with stuff like that because yeah. that that ties back into this point of judgment. Yeah, true. Maybe I didn't sin that way, but I've still made my mistakes. I have still yeah. sinned. And as long as I have repented, as long as I acknowledge who Jesus is and what he has done, that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. One of the whole points there is that you could have this horrible life in the past and then now you have a, you are born again, so to speak, to use our Christian yeah. term, right? You are, you are a new creation going forward and we have to be able to, and it's hard, but we have to be able to see that new person the way Jesus mm. sees that new person. Yeah. Yeah. So as, as we're getting and, close and, to go ahead. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Or, let me, let me real quick speak into that. Yeah. I love what you said there. Um, so, so I think it was Charles Spurgeon, right, that that wrote about or saw, maybe it was a true story, maybe he was just saying he saw a drunkard be beggar at one point, he walked by him and he had this thought, uh, if it, uh, um, what's the famous phrase, if not for the grace of God, go I, meaning, so yeah, maybe I haven't committed that sin, but maybe it's because of how I was brought up, maybe it was because of the context, like I was growing up, brought up with two loving parents, morally good, wouldn't say necessarily Christian, are now, praise God, but morally good, loving, respectful, right? I had great boundaries. I had great love and 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 forgiveness and grace within those boundaries. Um, and God, for one reason, allowed me to be in that family, but maybe not the next person. And again, I'm not justifying that person's sins or my sins away by saying they're still in control of their actions, but this goes back to knowing that person, 
right? And again, it's not to justify it. It's to soften our hearts and to have some empathy for how that person even got into that situation. So yeah, right. maybe I didn't sin like they sinned, but I don't even know if I can take credit for the good in my life, right? Every good gift comes right. from above. So for some reason, I can't explain the sovereignty of God in this way. He had grace in this area in my life and not so much in this person to where he let that person go, right? I, I remember... um First seven years of Christianity, it was 20 to 27 years old. I uh, I would have told you, yeah, I'm a sinner. I need great saving grace. But if you would have asked me if my heart is deceitfully wicked, as Jeremiah said, I probably would have told you the Bible answer. Well, sure. But deep down, be like, no, my heart's pretty not good, me. actually. Yeah. yeah, not me. Until I fell flat on my face at 27. And I'm so thankful for that, right? I was lying behind my wife's back, uh, borrowing money from from friends just to pay the bills, didn't tell her about it. We just kept going further and further and further into debt. I was commission only. Um, and instead of making the right choice, which was give up that job and get another one, my pride kept me going until I had nowhere else to turn. And we ended up going bankrupt. It was the hardest year of my life, but yet the best year of my life in the sense that God showed me another level of grace and, and really humility that I desperately needed. It's like he took his hand of grace off me and said, all right, I'm going to let you just keep going. And eventually I'm going to reel you back in. But I got to the point of almost essentially lying to my clients just so I could pay money, make money to pay my bills. I would have never thought I would have gone that far. But it says God saying, I'm just going to let you see how far you could go if I just take my hand of grace yeah. off of you. And to me, it started to expose the depravity of my heart without the power of the Holy Spirit working in my life. Yeah. And and really from that point, it's not that I don't struggle with judgment till now. It doesn't like it. I look at people that sin bigger than I do and still be like, what are you doing? How could you not get there? I just feel like I'm reined in quicker through the spirit because of some of the things that I, I think God has allowed me to go through now. Yeah. Does that, does yeah. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, I follow anyway. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so so we're getting getting towards the end of our, our hour here. Um, yeah. I like to give guys a chance to to jump onto something that that. I didn't necessarily ask, but something that maybe came to mind or a point about judgment, you know, maybe it's from one of your sermons or from a conversation you've had. What, what's, yeah. what's a lasting point for guys here? What's, what's a point you want to make sure that we leave everyone with as it relates to this idea of Christian judgment? Yeah, I think, um, well, first off from the outside world, I think one of the great verses to live by is Colossians for especially in our toxic society in our social media driven society in our i can put out whatever narrative that i want society in the political crazy uh, uh climate you briefly brought that up it's another hot part of mine i won't go into right <laughs> but um we just i think as christians we make ourselves look so arrogant and and jerk uh, i'm gonna say jerky uh, it looked like self-righteous jerks so often. And and, and we, we kind of like wear that as a badge of honor for some reason. And it's like, hey, did you not forget like what, what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 3, where no matter what you do, whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God. Ephesians, right? When you speak the truth, speak it in love. Like you are representing Jesus Christ. And the last thing I want to do is push people away from the church. No, I want to pull them into the heart of God. And I can stand up for truth and still do that. Now, again, it's up to them how to receive that. But I, I want to do the best I can on my end, right? I was going to this verse, Colossians 4, 5, and 6, where Paul says, Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Um, or uh, one of my favorite passages in Ephesians where he says, um, or no, I'm sorry, it's First Peter, where he says, um, oh, no, it's on the tip of my tongue. Hang on. Uh, be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you, but do it with gentleness and respect. So my one point would be don't be a self-righteous jerk. <laughs> that, <Yeah>. that does nothing. <laughs> if you care about populating heaven, realizing that God is the one that did the work in your life. It's not Warren. It's not Nick Tallow. I have nothing to boast about. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Um, that my goal, your goal, our purpose, every person that's ever been saved, that's ever been born, we have the exact same purpose. That is to glorify God in all that we do. How we live that out, how we do it is our calling. 
but in all my conversations and all of my posts and all of my texts and all of my my actions, man, I want to filter it through. What does the word of God say? I want that to be my filter, right? That's why it's bringing the word of God. And then I want to act accordingly in a way that, man, brings honor and glory to God and hopefully draws people into the heart of God, whether they're a believer or an unbeliever. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And that, that's a, that's a, that's a great place to, great place to wrap up there. And, and I yeah. uh, really appreciate your, your thoughts really appreciate what you had to say. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just good stuff. And and this is an important topic and people <laughs> have is, man. lots of questions about this. So hopefully we were able to give them some things to think about, not all the answers. We couldn't do that in an hour, yeah, but hopefully we give guys at least something to, yeah. th- to think about and, and help them as they're working through this. Cause it's such an important issue. So Absolutely. really appreciate your time. Yeah. Really appreciate well, your you. thoughts. Hope you have an awesome rest of your day, man. You too, Warren. Thank you, sir. Yep. Bye.